welcome back everybody you folks seen i had to do a quick uh studio change as uh as the place where i was at in in, in my new indoor studios is, is with a gym so anyways hope everybody can see me um bob madsen are you up bob there you are Gotcha, Mr. Chairman. You look good too, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> well, my 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 new indoor facility that just opened up uh, here in in Laguna Niguel. It's it's the Lores uh, Golf Lab, which is a physical therapy um, and gym, and you know adding golf in, into this. So uh, there's a child care right next door, and they have to have a bunch of kids. I don't know if that was really loud or not, but anyways. Uh, Bob, you and I have, have known each other as well a long time. We've both been in the business a very long time. Uh, I, I, I know for myself, I've had to adapt and adjust to, to the different times of how we, uh, we teach and coach uh, from when we first started. Uh, I know you've gone through uh, a, a lot of different changes as well and has, has narrowed it down to some uh, pretty neat programs that you're doing right now. So uh, why don't you take us uh, on that, that journey and, and what you're doing and why that you won the Teacher of the Year in 2017. That's what I was curious about. Hi, Tasha. Yay. Um, so a shout out to Josh Alpert. Um, he kind of pioneered the idea of doing a seminar virtually. And I think it was is it the Youth Golf Summit that was our initial attempt. And so thank you, Josh, because I don't think we would be here right now with that, without that inspiration. Um, also, I don't plan to have this take very long, so I'm going to whiz through pretty quickly. Um, there's an idea Randy and I have talked about to host more teaching committee days like we did at Virginia Country Club whenever that was. Was that last year, Mr. Chairman, uh, where the teaching yes. committee gets together and tries to better themselves and decide who should be invited to present. And one of the offers that I've made is we need to talk more about how to teach and not so much about golf. There will be a couple of offers in my presentation that have to do with teaching golf, but more about um, how to teach. Um, probably my team and I had five or six people working with me, professional educators galore. And we probably had 100 bullet points that we were ready to share or will be ready to share when this day comes. I boiled it down to about 20. And then I boiled it down to 10. And then I boiled it down to three. So these are just three. I hope you enjoy them. And then we've got what are called conversation starters at the end for Tasha or Randy or if Bryce puts them up on the screen, uh, whoever. And I'll take a whack at those or the three of us will. So three things today. One is, is it possible to coach one thing for an entire hour? Um, power of the do-over, as I call it, and kindness. The title of the presentation is kindness and other stuff. Don't ask me why I decided to title it one way and then put kindness at the end, but that's kind of where we're going. So is it possible to coach one thing for an hour? Uh, traditionally, we're not very good at it. You can skip to the next one, Bryce. We're not very good at it. We say we don't want to give too much information, and yet we do. Uh, I can't remember where I got the idea of putting my hands behind my back during the lesson, and then I, I could turn around. And as soon as I made one offer, I would have my index finger like crossed behind my back like this. See that? And then if I opened my mouth again and gave something else, I would have to have two fingers behind my back, or three, or four, or five. Right, so the offer there is you've got a tool that you can use to catch yourself. And if you were the student, would you be? A, would you want to be responsible for two or five or seven or ten different things? Um, for example, you can go to the next one, Bryce. We're working on balance, and I love the tippy toe finish, Chairman Chang. Thank you. We're working on finish, balanced on the lead leg, stable. I have my students hold for five seconds. I might have them close their eyes and hold for five seconds. I might have them close their eyes and pick up their trail foot for five seconds as the drill gets harder and harder. We know that if you're on balance at the finish, you would have necessarily been on balance at impact. I think that's from 
Seymour Dunn, 1921, a book called Golf Fundamentals. Uh, turns out maybe there's not a lot new under the sun, some of these old books. So let's say the student's going along really well and they're working on their balance and they're conscientious about it and they clank a few and get upset and they ask about their ball position. Do we bite on that? This section of my presentation is saying make sure that it's the right thing to do. Do I, do I coach multiple things during a lesson? Yeah, all the time. I might do a little bit on pitching. I might do a little bit on lag putting. I might show them how to make a tee time. We might even do a little bunker work. That's like five things right there. But I'm judging it as I go along, hoping as the craftsman um, that the time is right for all of this. My offer is to have you get better at coaching just one thing for an entire hour. Don't bite and take up other things unless it's the exact right thing to do. And for sure, don't give information to try to impress anybody on how much you know. We're guilty of that. Catch yourself, please. Does anybody have any so thoughts Bob, or questions? Yeah, I do. So when you did the first assessment, um, they, they come in to take for that one thing. Is there a plan that you set up with them prior to? It's like, look, this is going to take a series of four, five, whatever, 10, 10 lessons, and we're going to get to your, to your your goal by doing this one thing each lesson or just work on this and then call me in a week too big of a question can't overgeneralize or make a rule but if you want to talk about it Bryce you can go to the next slide for my friend if you want to talk about that for us Randy that would be awesome oh no I will in the, in the next session I'll just ask you like 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 what 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 you uh, what you do as far as uh, your, your book is filled and then in retaining them, uh, is, that a, is that a plan in, in your programs or it's just, uh, you know, like say, kind of individual or, or say group? You don't do a lot of group lessons. Uh, sure, I don't do a lot of group lessons. I have a pretty tight inner circle and most of my stuff is all done intuitively. Um, I do wake up in the middle of the night and start to plan, okay, Bill's coming at 8, Tracy's coming at 9.15. Uh, by the way, I try not to schedule back to back to back to back because I think that can get goofed up. I try to kind of oddball schedule it so I, I've got a few minutes of padding. And speaking of cues, my students all know that I need protein every two hours. Otherwise, they get, they get a hated lesson because I get woozy and headachey and and cranky. So I'm sorry, I'm not really answering your question, I don't think, but just intuitively, you know, how am I going to know how to stay on this thing? They want to go to ball position. Oh, I love coaching ball position. Let's do that too. I just, dude, I make it all up as I go along, probably to a fault. You can go, Bryce. Thank you for not, not answering my question. Well, maybe what I can do is understand it better, and I'll submit a better answer to um, the the forum. Because um, while I do dodge people's questions professionally, as mentioned here, actually, um, this is kind of what we're looking for. I think scatterbrain practice sessions suck. And if you run a scatterbrain golf lesson, guess what kind of practice session your students are going to perform? They got no chance. But if you run a super single-minded, clear golf lesson they've got to go they've got a chance to go produce a practice session that's also single-minded so you're actually coaching them on how to coach your coach themselves if that makes sense you know i'm sorry um are, are yes tasha i think you're on mute Oh, we're not hearing you. Let me let, let me ask the question first and go ahead and try uh, to get back on. Uh, Bob, you mentioned the, the, the forum again, and, and Tasha also mentioned uh, about the forum as well. I just want to remind everybody out there that uh, it's a new uh, resource page on our SCPGA web, website. You know, I want to thank uh, Bill Holbert for kind of champing champion in that, that project. And we got that uh, we got that up before this. So thank you, Bryce, and 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 Nikki, and everybody there for for getting this started up. As you can see, the uh, 
a, a little picture of that there. I think it might have been premature in, in doing that. But since you mentioned the forum, and Tasha always did to refer to it, the Teachers Forum is going to be the resource page on our website to get all the stuff uh, that, you're talk that we're talking about today, as well as uh, the book that normally we have at this um, at this event. Uh, that's, that will be there next year. But all that resource is there at the website, uh, as well as uh, the answer to my question that I just asked, Bob. I feel I feel horrible. No, I'm just joking with you. I'm just joking with you. The coffee's well, we, the coffee's we, kicking in. Carry we on. Can carry on. We can Tasha, are you up yet? I'm gonna learn something. No, nope. carry on. We're gonna maybe have to do some sign language or or, or text the message in. <laughs> what? She can also text me if she can hear me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So can you guys hear me? Here. There you go. You're on now. Sorry, Bob. Bitter. Okay. Absolutely no harm done. Good to have you back. So uh, the second of the three sections in my presentation today, uh, affectionately called the power of the do-over. So go to the next. You can go to the next one, Bryce. If the person is showing inexperience, it doesn't mean they need instruction. It means they need experience. So putting games and drills and exercises in place that give that experience, having them practice with partners, having them practice in oddball situations, having them practice with buddies, maybe with stakes and consequences, may be more valuable than whatever I can teach them. If I can teach them how to spend their time and gain experience, Right, we all fall down when we're trying to learn how to walk. We, we fall off our bike while we're trying to ride, but that's just part of the deal. And I think instructors, they, they teach too much after every failure. You can go to the next one, Bryce, please. Now let's say I put them in a situation that calls for a little seven iron from 100 yards and that's a half shot for them. And they jump in with a giant big wide stance. Am I gonna say something? Yeah, I'm going to ask for a half size stance to make things easier on their body and their instincts. But to let the situation be the teacher and let those do overs be the teacher, sometimes I feel a little bad, like I should be teaching instead of just sitting here tossing balls out of the cart. But um, I mean, I seem like I spend the, the whole day just saying, do another one, do another one. And, and learning happens and it's fun and it's easy on me and it's easy on the student. Um, you know, and, and then all of this, if you followed any of us around and watched a hundred lessons, I would think you would never see the same lesson twice. I certainly hope you would not. So it's always tough to try to box it into a presentation. Oh, I see Madsen does this. <laughs> Maybe once in a while, sort of. Uh, so my offer is to be calm, give them another ball, stick to the idea that experience may be a better teacher than you quite often. By the way, it's dumb to give people experiences that if it was another sport like rock climbing or snow skiing or surfing, they would be dead. So keep them on a level that they can succeed. You know, if you can't make four and a half foot putts regularly, move closer. You know, if you can't hit solid with a full swing with a nine iron, have them hit three quarter shots, have them hit half shots. My practice sessions, my coaching sessions are, are filled with tons and tons of success. You know, do we set up for failure and learn to stomach that? Of course we do. But the, the success, the successful repetition where to say, yep, 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 do another one. I try to have a steady diet of that. You guys want to chime in on that at all? Tasha, you had something? Yeah, I think Bob and I were talking about this earlier about when you have a person do a bunch of those do-overs during their lesson, I think you're giving them permission to hit the bad shot, learn from it. I think that's a really important part of being a coach is giving them permission to make those mistakes, to have the do-over. And I, Bob, you do a great job of that. And I think that's a big point here is that make it okay. Like make it okay that they can do that. And that, that way they get it as a part of their routine that they're reacting, you know, a certain way to those shots and then they get the do over. Yeah, cool. Thanks. I had a, uh, not a little girl, but a young girl 
um, noticing that I wasn't saying something after her bad shot. And I don't know if it's shame on her father, but he, re he behaved otherwise. So after every bad shot, there was some sort of a, um, an offer or a criticism or a shaming. And she was just about in tears, not having that be part of her lesson. Um, kind of ties into this last thing, which uh, Chairman Chang and the other teaching committee members have had a commitment for several years to see if we could find stuff that we all agree on. Because the teaching presentations can kind of be over here, and then they're over there, and then this, and then there's contradiction. And then in the seminars, the audience is likely to have a saboteur in it and you don't you have, you don't end up within a with with agreement all the time and i think that social media right now is a prime place to find argument and contradiction and so i decided to see you know how far could i undercut this to see if you know there's 200 and what was it 220 teachers and coaches are public on the line on this call uh, to see if we could all nod our heads up and down about one thing. And so kindness and other stuff became the theme of our presentation. And so I just ask for you to consider these aspects. I'm sure that we're all very kind and we're all including kindness without even having to try. Um, now, you can switch it, Bryce. Now, do I bark at people? Yeah, if one of my juniors loses it in their post-shot routine and gets all dramatic and sad and woe is me, I'm going to whack them upside the head, basically, with what the hell is the matter with you? Get your shit together. I'll bark at them, but I don't think that's being unkind. Really, the last thing I have, other than to recap the things that we've talked about, is coach one thing. Get really good at being able to coach one thing. We also talked about the power of the do-over, which I love so much. It's fun when you drop a ball down and the, and the do-over goes well. And all my students know the phrase, power of the do-over. And then kindness. I found this picture, and, and I think it's kind of brilliant. Like, it's, it touches my heart to, to, let's say that you're the coach, and you've got a drinking fountain available. And you lead the person to that drinking fountain so that they can take a sip and you push the button. Uh, this, this picture is, is super meaningful to me. Take what you will. So Bob, Already please, uh, you can go. Oh, no, 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 go, keep on going. That's okay. That's just the review. You can go to the next one, Bryce. So at the end of this song called Squirm, this is one of the last lines. And uh, yes, I'm a Dave Matthews nut. I only listen to Dave Matthews and podcasts. And now I have another one for, uh, find, was it Finding Mastery with Gervel? Yep. Finding Mastery with Michael Gervais. Mm -hmm. Kindness is your king. Heaven will be yours before you reach your end. It's kind of a daily mantra for me. And I'm ready for conversation starters if you guys want to hit me. Yeah, so when you get that first uh, student beginner, beginner just starting, uh, do you start uh, on the golf course as well? Like, like um, what is that, the uh, something 360 where they start at the putting green and they work with their way, with their, their way back? So that's a little bit of a curveball because I specifically sent you my conversation starters and now you've gone right straight off the menu. So I think as I said earlier, a novice is someone who has not started. So an absolute novice, maybe never been to a course, never touched a club, don't know anybody that plays golf, wouldn't know a tee time from a horseshoe. And then the beginner is someone that's begun in some way, shape or form. That would be a nice, if, if we could all get on the, 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 the vocabulary page that I'm on, I think that might be clarifying, but uh, I think as chairman knows, my my first lesson with almost everybody, I can't say everybody, but with almost everybody, I take tea markers out in the form of a couple of cones or water bottles or dip it bottles, 
and I tell them about the teeing area and I ask them to play their ball into the hole. There might be a field trip out onto our par three course, see the tee markers, draw an imaginary line, otherwise lines, lines don't really exist in golf. You have to draw them yourself. The target line is another one. And there's a hole in the ground and we're gonna go from the starting line to the hole, do you understand? And you know what everybody says? Everybody says yes. We start at the starting line and go to the falls in the hole. That's all there is to it. And if we make it any more complicated than that, I messed up. Did I fail to answer that question as well? So, yeah, yeah, you did. But uh, it's okay because I, I love I love how your mind works. And the, the thing is, though, so isn't the other question? Yes, I can do that. And then again, so how? Because most of the people that come in for a lesson for the first time are worried about one thing. Am I going to so hit the ball? Up, and so that, that, that question. Go ahead. There's so many levels to this, Randy, right? So because I start with the sport of Just golf. The big I, 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 what? Oh, you go ahead. I start with the sport of golf. This is how you play golf. And they ask me, do you, how do I hold it? And I say, I don't care. And they ask me, how do I stand? And I say, I don't care. And as long as everybody on the private practice hole or the short game chipping and pitching area that we use, or maybe a hole on the golf course is safe and everybody's having a good time, I think it's a good first lesson. We've gotten to know each other. We've picked up on each other's cues, let's say. Hey, that Madsen guy's okay. He kept me safe. It was easy. Golf is way simpler than I thought it was. And we have uh, too much of a strong urge to go, you know, grip, stance, ball position, alignment, weight distribution, set up, start of the backswing, backswing in that order. And years and years ago, we flipped that list upside down and started with fun and started with how to golf. Yeah. Well, that was answering my question. Thanks for once. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Place here where you can resign from the committee. Where is that? <laughs> Bob, you have a the second bullet point on your conversation, or I guess it would be the third one with the games, drills, and exercises that you use. I'm wondering if you could share with us ones that you use for some different skill levels of golfers. Well, that's fine, and I'm happy to do that. Just the main thing there is learn by doing, and and let's do a little better at giving people experiences. And, and staying out of it. Um, that, that's my big message there. You know, what, what is a lesson would maybe be where that conversation would start. And I think a lesson could be just simply putting a wooden stick three feet back behind the hole and have them practice lag putting, the goal being to get it past the hole without hitting a stick. Obvious reasons, right? Give it a chance to go in without having it go too far by. The point if you succeed, guys are hitting three balls each, two players with stakes maybe for a buck, play to 11 or play to seven. That's just an example. Another one would be, let's say there's three participants and they've each got two balls in the seven iron. We're gonna practice bumping and running. They each play their two balls. This is nothing new, I didn't invent this. Closest ball gets two points. The second closest ball gets one point. We just go all day long making up games like that and letting the situation, the golf course um, and those challenges uh, be the teacher. And I think all of us are really good at inventing games and drills and exercises. Many of us probably learned a bunch from our parents and our early teachers. I was lucky. I took close to 500 lessons before I ever gave one. So I was loaded with tools before I ever stepped on a lesson tee. Um, learn by doing. Uh, I think we have some questions from the audience. Uh, Mickey? Oh, yes, thanks, no. Randy. Uh, thanks, Bob. Uh, uh, along the lines of what you just talked about with games and activities, um, do you recommend starting those games and activities that are easier and warrant successful outcomes, then build toward more difficult or go more difficult and then make it easier if necessary? Or does it not really matter so long as you keep it fun, simple, and always adjust? And that's from Josh Alpert. Uh, what? Josh Alpert? Oh God! <laughs> answer the question, sure. Bob. Just answer the question. Way more starting out with doable and success and building up. Um, 
that's a surefire way. I think if I was coaching swimming, I would use the shallow end of the pool and work my way up. If I was teaching rock climbing, I would use flat land and work my way up to more and more steep slopes. But yeah, we for sure throw extra weight on the bar when the student's doing really well, especially throw extra weight on the bar and make it more difficult. And so, for example, I might take a person who can't break 80 from the white tees back to the blue tees. More often, I would take them forward to the red tees and have them build confidence, but I might push them back to the back tees for three holes or six holes or nine holes or a month, and let them return to the white tees and they could see how easy it is. Just an example. Hi, Josh. Thanks, Bob. We have we have one more, um, perhaps a comment about your holistic approach, uh, treating the whole golfer and the effect of that on learning. And that's from uh, Mr. Johnson. My buddy. Um, people call what I do holistic. I don't ever call it that. I don't really know what that word means. I would have to be guessing and then and then looking in the dictionary. I just kind of do what I do. I try to care for people and care for each person differently what they tell me thereafter is my main target so you know more fun relaxation fresh air with friends lower scores college scholarships whatever professional victory you know i just try to care for each person in, in the, the best way i know how and i know where my limitations are let's say like if they need new glasses i send them to an eye doctor if they need super high level personal training in terms of range and motion, range of motion and, and strength. I typically send them to Jeremy at, at Body Balance. Um, and I'd have to think for a second, other places I send people to other instructors occasionally with a for a second opinion. Um, but, you know, I don't teach meditation. I don't teach yoga. So I feel like I'm pretty far away from holistic. You might need to start it then, Bob. Uh, I just had a question. Are there any more, Nikki? Uh, that's it for now, Randy. Thank you. If you weren't so, if you weren't so busy making fun of me, you'd be able to remember your question. <laughs> no, it was, it was it was definitely a good one. Tasha, can you go? Yeah, I, I've got one. So, Bob, this might be taking things um, a little off the conversation starters, but you had mentioned earlier about like the one thing and sticking to one thing. And when you have a student who is asking a whole bunch of questions and tries to move you away from that and the lesson could potentially get a little chaotic with the number of things that they're trying to achieve, do you have any methods that you use or skills that you can recommend for us to keep things back on track, stick to the plan? Yeah, there would probably be a list of phrases that I could produce. Um, sometimes it's me and a nasty and a person says, well, I want to hit driver. And we're working on little half shots with an eight iron. And I would just say, no, no, <laughs> um, that's not what we're working on today. We're working on X, Y, and Z, and we don't need the driver interfering with what we're trying to do. I might say something like the student's not running the lesson. That's getting a little bit unkind, right? The Harmon Brothers taught me years and years ago as a teaching seminar with Mr. Johnson in San Francisco and learned a shit ton, excuse my language, and, and one of them is uh, the student doesn't run the lesson. Um, you just have to be aware, I think, and, and good at it and know when to maybe fight because the person has this suspicion, you know what, I've, I've got this cool feeling right now with this eight iron, can we do a few with a driver? And it might be the exact right moment to hand them a five wood or a driver and a longer club, and then whoo, giant improvement occurs. How, how, how do you know when to do that? I, hey, I you don't? don't? Oh, you don't know? <laughs> I didn't know if he was asking. I, I kindly guide them back onto what we're doing all the time. Amateurs tend to be scatterbrained and and one of the ways that I do it too is amateurs have a hard time coaching themselves. You know, I feel like the average golfer hits the ball solid, but it goes out to the right. And I say, good one. And they say, but it went out to the right. And they invalidate whatever the good ha that happened. So professionals and, and people that do get results in their practice, I feel like 
they switch it and they say that started to the right but i hit it solid so you're taking a little victory in how you talk to yourself and i coach students on how to talk to themselves and i tell them i'm talking to you how i want you to talk to yourself you miss a four foot putt because you get you know kind of shoveled it out to the right but you hit it solid and judge the speed right that might be a time to take a little win and i think that gets back to like giving them permission too as a coach is you kind of want to give them permission like you're going to hit some shots that aren't going to go where you want them to but the goal of what we're going to do for the next five minutes is to accomplish whatever a is and then you keep them on track that way so they're not you know always worried about where the ball is going Nice. If I can chime in with just a couple more, and then Randy, I'll hand it over to you in three or four minutes. Is that cool? Uh, no. Let me. Let, I had that question just came just came up. So, uh, from the business side of it, I mean, obviously, uh, getting you people out to play the game of golf is a big deal. Meaning, you have to utilize the golf course. How do you and your relationship, or the people that are out there that maybe you know don't have that um, that ability to get out on the golf course? Or I guess the question would be, uh, you, how should we um, uh, negotiate, I guess, with the golf course that we're at that say, hey, we, I, want, I need to use a golf course uh, more often um, for, from, from that standpoint, that don't have the, the situation with you, or what did you do to get to that situation where the golf course says, yeah, Bob, go ahead and use, use that tee time because we know you're developing golfers. Yeah, so it's a good question, and, and if somebody wants to reach out to me directly and talk about their, their situation specifically, that might be a better way to go. But I'm at Singing Hills for many, many reasons. One is there's 54 holes there and three private practice holes, so it's got a lot of room to roam. Wow. Um, what's going on with me doesn't help the person that's kind of stuck, right? If you're yeah. super busy golf course and you don't have much freedom of movement, you know, I'd have to think for a second. I, I, I'm not exactly sure how you solve that other than super early in the morning on the back nine and late, late in the evening on the front nine when things die down. When we first opened our 800 number and changed the message on the website, we were checking in 800 people a day and there was no gap between the people paying the full rate and the late rate. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then I have no idea what's going on at a high end private club like Del Cab, but I lost that gap. People were willing to pay the full rate at 12.52, and then the late rate started in, and I didn't know if I was ever going to do a playing lesson in my life. It's it's hard, and having the right facility, we use the term revenue-producing tea times, and our instructors are not allowed to book them, and they're not allowed to be be in them. Otherwise, our, our students don't pay extra for the golf course. Okay. Uh, Randy, we had a few more. We had a few more okay. questions come in, uh, Bob. For you, uh, first from Rick Johnson: How do you handle a disconnect between the parent's goal of the lesson and a junior's commitment level? He should probably answer that question. He probably knows more about it than me by a factor of ten. But it's just commu communication, and not to sound too, you know, overly simplistic, but just to, you know, I'll ask the kid, "Why are you here?" Just like Randy said, or uh, Randy, right? Why are you here? And and get agreement on that between myself and the golfer and the parents. Sometimes I invite the parents to stick around because they're super quiet and supportive and nodding their head up and down to what's going on. Sometimes I kick them out. You know, you need to sit aside and wait back at the clubhouse while I take your golfer out on the course. Um, I solve the disconnect. I just find it and solve it because I'm not going to try to coach through it or around it. It's it's senseless. It's yeah, you know, I get paid the same either way, whether the student's making progress or not. Um, I'll tell them that, um, and I'm pretty blunt. I'm pretty blunt with interference by the parent. Okay, thank you. We've got a few more, if if that's okay, uh, from it's Greg okay Anderson. From Greg Anderson, how long are your lessons and why? Good question. I grew up with a ton of half hour lessons and they were often too short. Um, not mentioning any names, but we catch the pro looking at their watch, super bad manners, don't do it. Um, by the time 
the by the time I was able to relax and get going because you're always trying too hard in front of the teacher which is a thing by the way that you should take into account your students are all trying too hard because they're in front of you and that would all go away and there'd be 12 minutes left in the lesson and it'd be time to say goodbye so I, I don't do half hour lessons really at all unless you're a known client let's say Kevin McCall comes for a chipping lesson his chipping's goofed up I spot something and we fix it in 10 minutes. That's a doable thing. That's repair work. That's different than the experience we talked about earlier in the power of the do-over. An hour is plenty of time for me to deliver what I need to deliver. And I do lots of longer lessons. I do lots of 18 hole playing lessons where four people split the cost of that four hour session. Uh, those are inner circle people. Not all my clients know. And they may not wonder why they get a 59 minute lesson, but I don't want to be around for four hours. If you're on the call, sorry. Okay, uh, next, next question from John Ortega. Uh, when do you introduce mechanics? Do they need to show a certain level of profici proficiency? Oh man, thanks John, <laughs> nice to see you. Um, <laughs> So when I think of mechanics, I think of angles, parts, pieces, and positions, and I try to stay away from them. I think a lot of the angles, parts, pieces, and positions have been still photography generated. If the still, the still camera had not ever been invented, we not, might, might not be talking about parts and pieces and angles and positions. I see, I see movement and flow. Um, I like trust and freedom. Um, and I try to keep people from talking to their bodies. We do it. And I, and I do it, but I pick and choose real careful. I think it's too easy to start talking mechanics and then you're not coaching the human being so much, you're coaching what their body is doing and it, free, it blocks them up instead of frees them up. Bob, I'll talk about all that for you in my segment. Yeah, I think we have just one more, um, which is a great one to, to end on, perhaps. Uh, what advice can you share for an associate who is starting to develop their teaching and coaching career? What are some great benchmarks to follow? So one of my heroes was a writer, and he was teaching writing, and one of his thoughts was, if you want to get better at writing, you have to write. So I take that straight to golf instruction, and I think if you want to learn how to be a better teacher, you have to teach. All three of us are doing it. We're out there teaching and trying to get better at our craft. Uh, one of the things we do at Singing Hills is we have an assessment form that some have used over the years. I've got one right now who just got his class A and he wrote his own assessment form. So he assesses a bunch of different points about the lesson starting with on time, how much was covered, what was covered, were drills used, were teaching aids used. And so we go over those together and I give him my feedback and we have a conversation about what went on in his lessons as he's trying to improve. He's probably only given 15 or 20 lessons in his life. So Bob, you got any uh, closing comments? I know you had a couple of points that you wanted to. Yeah, just just real quick, and I am trying to learn to talk fast in case I ever get on the golf channel. Um, before I forget, thank you to you, Chairman. Thank you to Billy McKinney for, um, you know, granting me permission to do this kind of stuff. I'm honored. So I don't like messing with people's golf swings, and I've developed three filters, and I would like for you guys to know what they are, and you can consider them in your teaching. So. I tend to leave their golf swing alone entirely if we can check these three boxes. One is, can they play all the shots that they need to play in order to shoot the scores they told me they wanted to shoot? You know, can they hit it low? Can they hit it high? Can they shape it? Um, what have you to shoot the scores that they tell me they want to shoot? Number two, are they going to hurt themselves? If the answer is, is yes, they're going to hurt themselves with the swing they came to me with, then I have a reason to jump in possibly coach the mechanics and fix it or rearrange or rebuild or redesign. And then the last one is, is it going to last into old age? So if they can hit the shot, they're not going to hurt themselves. And I see that it's going to last into old age. No touchy. No touchy. Leave them alone and teach them golf. Um, any questions on that real quick? 
Now, that was a great way to 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 end that segment there. Uh, Bob, oh, I got one more. Oh, one more thing. That's it. Pretty please. That's and then that's it. So, okay, cool. Um, one of the things I see on the lesson T is hoping the student does a good one. And so the teacher has a little bit of edge. And if you're hoping the student does a good one, you're way more likely to react to the, re to the shot and teach unnecessarily. So I invite everybody to get better at not hoping that the student does a good one. That's a nice way to, to, to end that. Bob, I'd like to thank you again uh, for your, uh, your commitment with the teaching committee on making everybody better. Uh, I definitely would love to come down and take a lesson with you. It sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> playing the game of golf is, I think, the big thing. You know, how we go about, uh, you know, do more playing is, is I think, extremely uh, important and where we're headed towards, as, as what Rick said earlier in his, in his, um, in his presentation. So thank you again for all you do for, for our section and for sharing uh, your, you know, your insight. Well, most of it, I mean, I you didn't answer most of my questions, but uh, thank you very much for all you do. Um.